Welcome to Super Returns 2015 in Asia and Hong Kong. Uh, Joshua. Yes. Just curious about your experiences, given that you've been a manager and investing in Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar for yep. the last couple of years, or for how many years would that yeah, be? Yeah, about four and a half years now. Four and a half years. Yep. Would uh, ask you, what are the challenges of setting up in Cambodia, Laos, right. and Myanmar? They're not developed private equity right. markets. Right. And I'd be curious to hear what kind of challenges you faced with them. Well, I think the first, the, the biggest challenge that we confronted when we started was actually just educating entrepreneurs about private equity. You know, we would, as we were fundraising for our first fund, um, we were building our investee pipeline. Uh, we would go and explain kind of our investing approach and, and um, that we took, you know, equity positions and companies. Um, and we really thought that we had actually uh, made a connection. Um, and as we were leaving, they would say, you know, one final question, you know, what interest rate do you charge on your loans? Um, <laughs> and we realized that nobody had really thought about taking on equity investors before. Right. So one was certainly educating the market about private equity. Um, another big challenge is finding local staff that have mm. the skill set and the understanding uh, to make private equity investments. Um, as a fund manager, we're very focused on building local capacity. Um, RLPs are development finance institutions that um, have a mandate to develop uh, local private equity fund managers. And so we've really tried to live by that. And the majority of our team is either Cambodian, Laotian, or Burmese. Um, but finding the staff that had the fundamental skill set to then be able to learn PE was also a challenge. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, and, and we got a little bit lucky in this respect, but I think, you know, it's really about being local in frontier markets. Mm -hmm. um, and by being local, I mean having being very embedded in these local communities. Um, it's not about coming and, and hiring a senior person in government to find links. It's about knowing the entrepreneurs. It's about being bedded down with the entrepreneurial class that you want to invest in. Um, and in Cambodia, Laos, we had a great opportunity um, in that. In Myanmar, um, we're a little newer to the market. We have an affiliated consulting business. Um, we have about 30 consultants in Cambodia, 12 in Laos, and about five in Myanmar. Mm. And so they help us to understand the market, understand the entrepreneurs that we want to invest in. And so, you know, it's really getting yourself local in these markets, I think, is another big challenge for setting up. So it's all about consultants in the markets, or do you actually have team members in these markets as no, well? No, we also have team members in the markets. We're, we're, very, we're separated um, businesses. We started as a consulting firm. Um, that gave us, I think, our local market understanding and knowledge. Um, but when we started our private equity fund, we split the two out. Uh, but they still have the same ownership structure. Um, and so we are able to tap into our consulting expertise and, and our, the relationships of our consultants um, when it's useful to our investment business. And what are the differences that you see between Cambodia and Laos? We'll get to Myanmar because that's a okay. very different animal altogether. Right. Right. But Cambodia and Laos are often lumped together. Yeah, uh, they are. They're actually not very different similar markets. markets. Yeah, so no, what did you yeah. find are the major differences and the challenges yeah. you face that are unique to each of these markets? Sure. I mean, I think um, in Cambodia, it's an incredibly uh, investor-friendly, pro-FDI um, government. Um, they've opened their doors to any investor that wants to come in and follow kind of the rules. Um, so if you look at the legal framework for investment, it's, it's international standard. Right. Um, but where that falls down a bit, unfortunately, is in the enforcement and in the um, execution of that legal framework. Um, you have oftentimes kind of unclear um, or, or uh, different type of execution depending on who you are. And so it's really having to understand kind of the local sector dynamics. Mm. Um, as I mentioned in the panel earlier today, um, you know, you also have to look at the regulator for different sectors in Cambodia. The National Bank in Cambodia of Cambodia is a superb regulator mm -hmm. and has really done a lot to build um, the financial services sector there. Um, in uh, there's other regulators that maybe aren't quite as strong as the National Bank, and, and they're more they can become an impediment to to growth. Um, so in Cambodia, you have this wonderful kind of investment environment, but you need to understand kind of how how to operate within it, um, given the enforcement challenges. Uh, Laos is different. It's still a communist country. Um, it is, you know, slowly opening itself up to market activities. Uh, the government is still actively involved in most sectors. Either they have ownership stakes of SOEs in these sectors. Um, they have a very tight regulatory influence. Um, and so it's really understanding kind of the government's involvement and how you um, manage that. Um, you know, the challenge with Laos, and, and, and one of the things that we've really had to look at is, you know, it's a relatively small domestic market. Uh, there's about 7 million people. Hmm. The GDP, I think, is half of Apple's uh, Q4 profits, <laughs> net profits. 
Um, so you can kind of get a sense of the scale. Right. Um, it's a small market, but um, you know, there, there are pockets of opportunity. Um, there are a couple domestic um, segments that are large enough. We think ICT is large mm -hmm. enough, Agri Business. Um, Lao is transitioning with this opening of the ASEAN economic community mm -hmm. from what we used to call a land-locked country to now a land-linked country, and that they really are a through fair, through fair excuse me, um, between China and Vietnam mm -hmm. and Thailand. Um, and so there's some opportunities there. So I think you know, with each country, you know, we, we have to look pretty specifically at the, at the unique and specific mm -hmm. issues of it. And now coming to Myanmar, because Myanmar yeah. is now opening up, you've got right. a new election coming up just yep. around the corner. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, at this moment, it seems like everybody stands still. They're waiting mm. for, right. to see what the outcome of the election right. is. What is your view on what's happening out there and how you're tackling what you're right. seeing out there? You know, the biggest challenge in Myanmar for us is, well, there's two challenges, I guess. The first is the regulatory environment is changing so quickly um, and oftentimes um, somewhat opaquely um, advertised in terms of how it's changed. It, it, it's tough to know exactly what is the framework that you're dealing with and what are the laws that you're dealing with for your sectors. Um, and then the other thing is just understanding the relationships between business people mm -hmm. and the big conglomerates. Um, we have a very um, you know, focused strategy on, on investing in transparent, innovative businesses that follow standard international kind of um, approaches. Um, and so really having a good understanding of who your sponsor is connected to, what um, activities they've been in beforehand um, is pretty key for us. Mm -hmm. uh, but no doubt when Myanmar, and we, we fundamentally believe Myanmar is moving in the right direction, um, over the course of the next 10 years, Myanmar will be a great private equity market. Whether it's a great private equity market in a year or in three years is a bit of a question. Yes. Um, uh, and so that's how we view Myanmar. But it's um, exciting, and certainly you know when you when you operate in frontier markets like ours, you know Cambodia has got uh, 16 million population. Laos has about 7 million. Depending on what census you believe in Myanmar, about 55 plus. Yep. Um, so it can be a game changer in terms of kind of the overall market opportunities. Absolutely. So, and the question I have is on the stock exchanges. Okay. So Cambodia and Laos, you know, the stock exchanges haven't been as successful as right. one would have hoped for. Right. I think you have two equities listed in Cambodia and yeah, two in to be Laos, three. Yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and Myanmar is moving to a new stock exchange, so we have no idea what's happening. But uh, what I heard was that the Thai stock exchange is developing their CMLV exchange as well. Okay. Um, mm. Just curious, that how important is that to you from a future investment standpoint? Because value, it's all about valuation at the end of the right. day, and perceived valuation is very often driven by stock markets across the world. Right. And the ha lack well, of certainly stock Certainly all of our market. comps are based on multiples of exactly. publicly traded firms, right. And so how do you deal with that, and how do you foresee that going right. into the next five years? Right. Well, first of all, I guess before I directly answer your question, I think um, it, 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 certainly the stock exchanges in Laos and Cambodia have not developed the way that we had all hoped five years ago. Um, but their development has not been without benefit. Um, it's really gotten entrepreneurs thinking about how they make real value out of their business. And it's not necessarily on the profits at the end of every year that they harvest out. It's about creating equity value. Mm -hmm. um, this was a foreign notion five or six years ago um, in Cambodia and Laos. And, and when the stock markets got promoted and they were a big fanfare around them, you know, there was constant talk about it. So now when you talk to entrepreneurs, they understand much more about how they're going to get rich ultimately from the businesses that they're creating, which is a useful tool for us. It also helps these guys to understand if they do want to list um, ultimately, you know, how, what uh, roadmap to follow in terms of you know, board governance, audits, mm -hmm. financial controls. And so we've seen a lot of positive influence on these stock markets. Um, that said, you know, they certainly haven't developed the way that we've hoped. And, and when we do, um, you know, our valuations of our, you know, either pre-investment or when we're marking, you know, on an annual basis or quarterly basis, you know, we do use regional exchanges, which are often, you know, not ideal. It's hard to use a fast food uh, chain in China and compare it to one in Cambodia. Um, it's hard to say those multiples <laughs> equate, um, but oftentimes it's the best thing we've got. Um, you know, for, so it is a challenge. It's something that we struggle with, and we do look at the alternative exchanges. It's great if Thailand is moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a very positive for us. We look at the, the Catalyst Exchange in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, and so there are other exchanges that we could look at, the London AIM, but that's a little far for us. Um, but for us, certainly, exits have to be from strategic buyers. I mean, I think that is our core area of focus. Um, particularly with the opening up of ASEAN economic community, we think there will be more businesses looking to expand in our markets. 
Um, and what we've seen to date is that most of them are expanding through buying assets rather than just moving it on their own. And I think it's because they recognize it's difficult to build businesses from scratch in these markets. Yes. Um, and so we really focus our exit strategies on strategics that might be interested in our market beforehand and, and try to court, court those relationships. But um, we don't give up hope yet that the stock markets will ultimately um, take hold. I think in Cambodia, there's one or two listings that could change the game. There's a big bank that certainly, if they were to list, would, I think, bring a lot of international attention to the markets. Um, so we're still hopeful. And curious about valuations. One mm -hmm. last question is valuations is one area where we hear, keep hearing valuations are too high. Are you mm -hmm. seeing that? Because with such a small market right. and not too many competitors, right. do you, would you say one of the advantages you have is valuations or better valuations? I think so. I, mean, I think Myanmar is a little bit different. They seem to be pretty high. I mean, everybody, I think current companies and entrepreneurs in Myanmar, they, they're drinking the Kool-Aid as well and they think they're in a great position. So they, they, they see themselves quite um, valuable mm -hmm. and, and having a high value. In Cambodia and Laos, I think there's a little bit more realism. Um, in Cambodia in 2007, um, eight, it would have been also outrageous because they were, you know, they were the hot country at that time, and, mm -hmm. and um, so they all were pretty, pretty um, thoughtful of their value. Uh, now, I would say valuation is not the biggest issue. Um, you know, in fact, in our, in both of our markets, there's very few, very little competition. Mm -hmm. In Laos, we're really the only one. Um, in Cambodia, there's one or two others that are around there. Um, a very good fund in CTOR, which is a social impact investor, but we co-invest with them quite a bit. Uh, they share a common view that, to us. But um, aside from that, so you know, we're typically not in a situation where we're bidding against others. Um, it's more about getting the, the entrepreneur to understand how we're thinking about valuation, mm -hmm. getting them to understand a comparables approach rather than just a, this is what I think I'm worth approach. Um, but so far, you know, we haven't fallen down on valuation when we haven't gotten a deal done that we wanted to. It's usually been around you know, their, their lack of interest in hiring a CFO that we think is appropriate or something like that. Um, the valuation is you know, not overly expensive. And lastly, but not yep. least, you're raising a new fund. Yes, we are. Yep. Uh, what's been your experience with the first fund uh, in terms of exits and yep. uh, what is your desire for the second fund? Yeah, well, so um, on our first fund, it, we, it's an SME fund. Um, we started in our first investment in late 2010. Mm -hmm. Our average hold period is on our investments is about three and a half years. Um, so we haven't exited any businesses yet. Mm -hmm. um, we think there are two or three now that are ready for exit and that we've kind of grown the value to a point where we think now we'd get the most for our LPs if we did exit. Um, but our overall, we're very happy with our portfolio. Of course, we have a couple that haven't performed the way we would have liked, but we're broadly very pleased with it. Um, we have a LP base that I think understood when they invested in our first fund that we might not have a lot of exits when we raised our second fund, given the nature of the markets and the, si the, the types of businesses that we were investing in. Uh, so we've been fortunate enough, we think we're moving towards a first close um, in our new fund. That again will include Myanmar. Um, uh, you know, we, we were targeting 50 million for a final close. We're hopeful that we'll get there. It looks, we're cautiously optimistic. Um, our first close will be south of that, but not too far south, I think. Um, so yeah, we're, we're excited about it. We think you know, these markets hold a lot of opportunity and, and we're here for the long term. So um, we'll be here in 20 years and hopefully we'll be right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And thank wish you very much. you all the very best. Thank you for taking very the time to meet with me. I appreciate fundraising. it. Thanks. Thank you.